involved in this conspiracy at one level or another, who were curious to know about its origins, about its history, and about the extent of its operations in the world today. It was written for that very select group, and it was only accidental that uh, people like myself and some others got hold of copies of it and began to talk about it, and the word got out, and uh, first thing you know, a lot of people who weren't intended to read it started to read it and become alarmed about it, and so the publisher, which was Macmillan and Company, pulled it. They said, no, we're not going to reprint this book anymore. Professor Quigley himself, by the way, was very irate at that. He, uh, he, was, uh, he started a lawsuit, as a matter of fact, against Macmillan, but uh, this is another story. There was at least one publisher in uh, California that started to pirate the copies. He made a beautiful replica of it. You could hardly tell the difference between the original and this. He sold thousands and thousands of copies. And it, it was embarrassing for Macmillan to say, well, we've got to stop him from doing that because they were at the, at the same time saying there's no market for it. <laughs> and so Macmillan finally relented and put the book back into print. Well, anyway, you can buy a copy of it today, either the pirated version, which I think is more valuable because it's more limited edition, <laughs> or you can buy the original thing from Macmillan. That's another side issue. The important question here is, what did these books say? I'm going to give you an overview of my summary of it, and then I'm going to come back and give you excerpts from the books themselves to illustrate that my summary is accurate. Otherwise, you may wonder, uh, Quigley didn't really say those things. But here's my summary so you can get the whole picture first, and then we'll look at the details. Quigley said that at the end of the 19th century, a secret society was formed in England by Cecil Rhodes. Now, as many people know, Cecil Rhodes was uh, one of the wealthiest men of history of all time. He was the chancellor of South Africa. He had acquired the possession of almost all of the gold mines and diamond mines in South Africa had used this tremendous uh, access to the natural resources of that country primarily for his own personal use. Very wealthy person. What we don't know generally is how he used that money. Most people think that, well, it probably went to his heirs. It did not. Cecil Rhodes created seven wills and very specifically instructed uh, his executors how to dispose of and use this great wealth. And he said it should be used for the purpose of creating a secret society. And that's how it was, and still is, by the way, being used. Now, one of the wills created the Rhodes Scholarship. We all heard about that. And the general impression there is that isn't it wonderful that this man Rhodes set aside a big chunk of money for the education of worthy young men and women? Well, that's kind of a surface view. He did set aside a big chunk of money for the education of worthy young men and women, but the definition of worthy meant that they had to have a certain worldview, they had to be smart, they had to believe in global government based on the model of collectivism. They had to be a little bit ruthless. And they had to be capable of being enlisted into the secret society. This was the recruiting arm of the secret society to a large extent. It was a recruiting fund, not an educational fund. The other wills are unknown completely to most people. They have no idea what that money was used for and how it was allocated in these other wills. I said uh, seven wills before. Actually, that was a mistake. It was five wills. He wrote five wills. And the scholarship fund became the best known of them, and the others are pretty much even unknown to this day. This secret society exists today continues to exist, and has been a major historical force since World War I. Quigley says that every major event in history from World War I has been dominated and directed to a large extent by this secret society. 
The goal of this organization originally was to expand the British Empire's culture and political system and domination over the entire world, originally. Rhodes felt that the English uh, represented the finest, uh, the highest watermark in culture, was the finest race in the world, the smartest people, the most benevolent people, and uh, they had an obligation, you see, to rule the world so that all of the ignorant people of the world could benefit from this. It was an act of noblesse noblesse. They had this obligation. Somebody had to do it to protect these poor ignorant people from themselves. It might as well be them since they had this wonderful culture, this great language, and this great outlook of what the future should be, a world built on the model of collectivism. Now that evolved very quickly after Cecil Rhodes' death to a different view. It was no longer the British Empire that was to be at the center, but there was a world government to be created. The geographical axis shifted from London to New York and became the United Nations, but nevertheless the original concept that the members of the secret society would rule from behind the scenes. They would not be the major political figures. They would be the ones who selected the major political figures and who funded the major political figures. They would not be the great teachers or the uh, historians who wrote the textbooks. They would be the ones who hired the great teachers and funded the historians who wrote the textbooks. They would always work behind the scenes. That was the, the model that he set up. The method by which they would do this was very precise. They knew that you could not really control the masses directly one-on-one. -on -one. You had to do it through the organizations to which they belonged. They called them the power centers of society. Man has a herd instinct. We belong to groups. We follow leaders. We move in groups. We sometimes even think in groups. And so they recognized a long time ago that all you had to do if you wanted to lead the masses is to capture control of the groups, the leadership of the groups to which people belonged, the political parties, church organizations, labor unions, media outlets, great corporations, all of the groups, the power centers of society, you could control them with a relatively small number of people if they were well organized, dedicated, and funded. And then those people would indirectly control the world. That was the model. The structure that Cecil Rhodes created, and remember this is all described primarily by Professor Quigley, was out outwardly modeled after the Jesuit order. That's right. I was surprised to read that. The Jesuit order? Quigley was a great admirer of the structure of the Jesuits, and he decided to model his secret society after that structure. But at the deeper level, it was clear that he borrowed the structure from the Illuminati. And now everyone knows that the Illuminati existed at one time, was created in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, but shortly thereafter it was exposed in Bavaria. Uh, the police raided it, they arrested its members, they discovered its, its uh, ledgers and its books and its papers, which is why we know so much about them. They're part of the public record now. We know what the Illuminati was trying to do and how they were structured and how they organized and so forth. And so that's part of the record, but we are told that the Illuminati ceased to exist after that date. I think it probably did, but whether it did or not, certainly others like Cecil Rhodes picked it up. They picked up the concept. I don't know if there's a historical continuity back to Adam Weishaupt. I don't think it makes an awful lot of difference when we realize that there are people like Cecil Rhodes who read Adam Weishaupt's work and said, hey, this is a good idea. Let's use it. And that's basically what Cecil Rhodes did. He adopted the strategy that Weishaupt created of he called it rings within rings within rings. 
That means that the center of the secret society would be run by one individual with perhaps a little brain trust around him of two or three people. They would be the absolute rulers of this whole structure. Then they would create around them a ring, as they called it, a larger organization, which they would dominate. They would control it absolutely from the center. But the other members who were recruited into this larger organization would not be allowed to know that there was an inner control and direction. They were brought in for a lesser view of the whole purpose. And that was the outer ring. And that might be 20, 30, 50 people, maybe 100 people. And then outside of that, there would be a larger ring, another organization created with hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people. And they would not be allowed to know or would they even suspect that there was an inner ring controlling the larger outer ring. And this is what Weissop called rings within rings within rings. Cecil Rhodes thought that was a dandy idea. And so he adopted it as the structure for his secret society. Now in his group, the inner circle they called the Society of the Elect. That was the name Rhodes put to it. It originally consisted of Cecil Rhodes and a brain trust from British banking and politics. A very small number of highly placed, very wealthy people. The center of gravity, as I mentioned a moment ago, shifted eventually to the Rockefeller Group in the United States with centers of influence in such other organizations as the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, and that sort of thing. We've all heard about these. And the goal shifted away from the control from the British Empire to a international control through something called the New World Order, is the phrase they adopted, with control primarily focused in New York with the United Nations meant to be the hub of this global government. And I should say global government, not just any global government, but one based on the model of collectivism, which means total control over every human being. Not much room left there for personal freedom. Now the secondary rings around the society of the elect were called round tables. And they were formed in the United States, in Britain, and all of the former British dependencies. And they still exist today. They operate under that name. Around the round tables, a larger ring, a tertiary ring, was formed. And they called them front groups in a generic sense in each country where there were round tables. And they took on the name in the dependencies of the former dependencies of the British Empire, they took on the name of Royal Institute for International Affairs. That's where you'll find them today under that name in all of the countries, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and so forth. The Royal Institute of International Affairs. But in the United States, the word royal didn't go over too well. And so they changed it completely and they called it the Council on Foreign Relations but it has exactly the same relationship to the round tables which is surrounding the society of the elect, which is the secret society that still functions today, was created by Cecil Rhodes. And ladies and gentlemen, after a hundred years of operation and of penetration into the power centers of society, the Rhodesian network, as I call it, now is close to its final achievement which is its goal, the creation of a true new world order. Now, I call it the Rhodesian Network because one of the things we have to realize is that itself, it has no name. Isn't that brilliant? Quigley, when he writes about it, doesn't know whether to call it the group or the network or the Rhodes, or the Rhodes group. He calls it all these different things. And you see, they, ca they uh, carefully and consciously decided not to have an official name. Well, if you don't have a name, it's pretty hard to talk about a structure like that. So that was one of the very smart moves they made, did not have an official name. I have given it a name, so I can talk about it. I call it the Rhodesian Group or the Rhodesian Network, the Rhodesians. I hope it sticks because that's exactly what they are. 
Now, I said that this group is dominant now, is coming close to fruition of its ultimate goal in the Western world. I very carefully said the Western world because I wanted to differentiate between what's going on in the Western world